mind automatically goes to what you previously thought you knew rather than looking for a new perspective. You know what I mean? So you kind of mentally settle into settle into your previous observations, you know, if you're not careful. <laughs> no, we're, but we're signing the blame. <laughs> That's right. That's right. We got three minutes. Don't worry, you got plenty of time. Y'all visit. No, I got the clock up there. That's the game clock on the wall. That's the clock. That's the game clock. It's all right. Don't wake me up till it's time. Nehemiah. You know, I wonder what the name Nehemiah means. Jehovah comforts. Hmm. Hello. How are you? I'm good, thank God. Roaring and waiting to get into Brother Nehemiah. I got two minutes. I tell you, I got a. I have a method here. That's all right. All right. Did you get notes when you came in? Everybody get notes. Joe, were you able to sort them out, put them linkable online or whatever you were doing with them? Okay. Uh, the introduction to Nehemiah is the same, and then we have a line-by-line line on uh, the book of Nehemiah. I've added two pages. So Joe was saying it's going to have 50 mile an hour winds tomorrow. Did anybody else hear that? 50 mile an hour winds tomorrow? If so, there's going to be some trees knocked down in people's ways, among other things. And some vans blown off the road. What time does the wind mess start up? Tonight. Well, in closing, let me say. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's pray. Father, we bless you. Lord, um, I thank you for those that are here and those that are coming, those that are watching online. Lord, um, all of us could be doing something else and be somewhere else, but we're here seeking you and seeking interaction with you and your Holy Spirit and your word. So, Lord, we ask that you would enlighten us to your word, Lord. Help us to see it as it was written and help us to see how to apply it to our own lives. God, um, as we're looking at Nehemiah, just reveal to us things that have uh, seemed to be hidden from us in the past or are those things that have been revealed previously, reveal now in more depth. We ask you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. 
So we are in the midst of a little sequence of three um, books. Uh, we started with Ezra last week, this week Nehemiah, and next week Esther. Esther really goes between the two books chronologically. And if you've got your little um, timelines there, um, the introduction to Nehemiah, just by way of review, this was written sometime after 440 BC. That's what's generally believed. The book of Nehemiah is a historical narrative, meaning that it is a, a, a history, um, it's recorded history, it's not a prophetic book, it's not poetry, it's not a gospel, the style is a historical narrative. So it gives some details uh, having to do with the Persian kingdom and um, uh, the Persian kingdom's um, court officer, the cupbearer known as Nehemiah, who became the second governor of Jerusalem for the returning exiles. Uh, after the after the Babylonian conquest, and then the Persians conquered the Babylonians, so we're we're um, in Nehemiah tonight. We did Ezra last week. We'll do Esther next week. Next week we're actually going to do Esther twice, and um, we'll do Esther from a Jewish perspective as written, and then we'll do Esther from the perspective of uh, it being a prophetic paradigm of the Bride of Christ, the relationship with the Bride of Christ. So we'll go, um, I'll try to do both of them next week. We'll go through it as written, as the Jews view it, and then we'll go through it. As, it's, there's a mystical interpretation of Esther that I think you'll find interesting, uh, with Esther being a type of the bride of Christ. So we'll look at that in some depth next week. It'll be a little different than the way we've approached some of our studies in the past, but um, not too different. And so if you're looking at your timeline, um, uh, there's a decree by Cyrus for the Jews to return to Jerusalem and rebuild about 536 B.C. The first group, group of Jews comes under Zerubbabel. Um, he was the initial governor of uh, Jerusalem that was sent out. And the first temple, or rather the second temple was built under Zerubbabel. And so from that point forward, uh, the temple up until the time of Christ, even though we call it Herod's temple, it's really Zerubbabel's temple. Herod just added some uh, more features and additions on to it. So Zerubbabel is credited with rebuilding Solomon's temple. After that group of um, uh, Zerubbabel's crowd comes, there's a lag in time, and as I mentioned, Esther um, appears somewhere in that chron chronology between Zerubbabel's first group and then Ezra's group coming online. Ezra uh, is sent to Jerusalem some 50 it ranges from 20 to 70 years, depending on what you read, between Zerubbabel's group and uh, Ezra's group. But Ezra is sent out as the second um, leader of the second group. And then Nehemiah is sent as the governor after Ezra for that same group of people. Um, and then the prophets Haggai and Zechariah overlap uh, Ezra and Nehemiah. They, from last week in Ezra, they're actually quoted by name uh, in the book of, of Ezra. So we're not going to review Haggai and Zechariah this week. We're just kind of setting the stage for where they fit in the timeline. Under key verses in Nehemiah, we're going to read these again in a few minutes, but Nehemiah 111, this is Nehemiah praying, O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. I just want to pause for a second. One of my favorite things about the book of Nehemiah is his prayers. He has a whole lot of short one, two-line prayers that um, if you've ever been like me and felt like if you don't have a long time to spend, you shouldn't even bother to try to pray, you're wrong because Nehemiah often just prays with a one-liner. And um, God doesn't despise short prayers, long prayers, or intermediate prayers. So don't... Um, uh, don't omit the fact that Nehemiah gives us an example of short prayers that's kind of unparalleled in the Bible. So let the prayer of this your servant, uh, to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name, give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. And he says, I was the cupbearer to the king. And so this was a court position. You may remember that uh, Pharaoh had a cup uh, bearer who Joseph prophesied to in prison. And Pharaoh restored the cupbearer to his position. He actually told um, Pharaoh about Joseph and brought Joseph to the palace. So this uh, Nehemiah was a cupbearer, a Jewish cupbearer to the Persian king. 
Nehemiah 2, 4, the king said to me, what is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven. And I answered the king, that one liner, then I prayed to the God of heaven is all it says. Here he's, in, he's standing right next to the king. And it says he offered up a quick prayer to the God of heaven. And so this, um, uh, this firing off a of prayer, we don't know what he prayed, but apparently it was effective. He says, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my fathers are buried so I can rebuild it. Come on in, y'all. Grab some notes on the table out there. There's a set of notes on the table right when you're coming through. Right, up, right there are some handout notes. There you go. I'm still introducing the book, so you're in good shape. We're in Nehemiah. How are y'all? From Mexico, New Mexico. Do you, New Mexico. New Mexico. Oh, do you need a need a Bible? We got plenty in the library. I one. Okay. Blind. Okay. A All right. Good. Not good that you're blind, but good you're a listener. Glad to have you. There he does. And so Nehemiah four four, um, uh, another example of a key verse from Nehemiah. Hear us, O our God, for we're despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they've thrown insults in the face of the builders. This is indicative of Nehemiah's prayers concerning those that oppose the work of God. And it's kind of like David. Other than David, I don't know anybody else in the, Bi in the Bible that prays down judgment on the enemies of God uh, like Nehemiah does. And Nehemiah has some very consistent adversaries all through the book. In Nehemiah 6.15, it says the, the wall was completed in 52 days. And so we're about to read the account of the rebuilding of the wall of Jerusalem. And uh, when all the, our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. And so this is the, uh, the paradigm book for those who have rebuilt Jerusalem in 1948 and following. Uh, Jerusalem was taken again by the Jews in the, the 1967 Six-Day War. But they used this book of Nehemiah as kind of a, um, a rallying point for the rebuilding of Jerusalem. And some of the things they went through, of course, the Jews in our modern times have gone through as well. And so open to Nehemiah chapter 1 and verse 1. The words of Nehemiah, the son of ha Hakaliah, and it came to pass in Chislu in the 20th year as I was in Sushan, the palace. Anybody ever heard Sushan before? Sushan is, is the, where have you heard it? Go ahead. Okay, so Sushan in the book of Esther in chapter 1, that's the king's palace in Esther. So as I said, Esther is um, uh, overlaid between Ezra and Nehemiah. And so the, the Persian capital is the same that's mentioned in Nehemiah. He's the cupbearer there. That Hanani, one of my brethren, came, and he and certain men of Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. And the wall of Jerusalem is also broken down, and the gates thereof have been burned with fire. And it came to pass, when I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days and fasted, and I prayed before the God of heaven. Now this is, I think this is an early indication of why God chose this guy as a rebuilder. His attitude was not, um, oh, that's terrible. His, he was grieved in his spirit to the point where he sat down and wept and fasted and prayed and sought God. And verse 5 is um, uh, the beginning of one of his prayers. And I said, I beseech you, Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God that keeps covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Let your ear now be attentive and your eyes open so that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night, for the children of Israel, your servants. And Lord, I confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Both I and my father's house have sinned. And so notice he, he takes this position of prayer in identifying with those that have, have offended God. He doesn't say they have offended you. He says we defended you. In, a, um, in, in due time, we'll come to Daniel 
Daniel chapter 9 is very famous for Daniel, uh, who had been taken into captivity as a young man, perhaps 12 years old, identified with the sins of Israel. And he, he repeatedly says, we did this and we did that, which Daniel could not have done. He was identifying with the sins of his people and confessing the sins of his people uh, in first person. So this is um, the, the fancy term is vicarious repentance. You and I can do the same thing in confessing the, the sins of our nation and the sins of other people. We identify with them. We don't accuse them. You see the difference. He, rather than him saying those rotten people, we. And so he, he approaches it that way. Verse 7, continuing in this, this um, prayer. We have dealt very corruptly against you and have not kept your, your commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments, which you commanded your servant Moses. Remember, I beseech you the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you transgress, I'll scatter you abroad among the nations. But if you turn to me and keep my commandments and do them, though there were of you um, cast out to the uttermost parts of heaven, yet I will gather them from there Bring them to the place that I have chosen to set my name there. And now these are your servants and your people who you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. Verse 11, Lord, I beseech you, let now your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name and prosper. I pray you that your servant this day and grant him mercy in the sight of this man for I was the king's cupbearer. And that's kind of archaic language, but he was asking for mercy in the sight of the king. as he, uh, he's, he's even now wanting to bring it to the king. And so in, in uh, chapter 2, just moving right into this narrative, it says he was the cupbearer to the king, and the king's name is Artaxerxes. I mentioned last, last week, this is probably Esther's son or Esther's grandson. There were actually three kings named Artaxerxes. One was Esther's son. One was Esther's grandson. We don't know who the third one was. So this is probably her son or grandson because of the timing of it. And which makes you think this guy probably was favorably disposed towards the Jews anyway, since his mother or his grandmother was a Jew. So it says, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I hadn't been... Um, uh, sad in his presence before, and apparently uh, it was a capital offense to go in sad and to um, uh, to bum out the Persian king was a death sentence. <laughs> you've made me you've made me depressed. I'm going to have you killed now. That was the response. So therefore, the king said to me, "Why is your countenance sad, seeing you're not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart." And his response: Then I was very afraid. The reason he was afraid was because the king could have him dispensed with if he was um, uh, reigning on the king's parade. So I said to the king, let the king live forever. Why shouldn't my countenance be sad when the city, the place of my father's sepulchers, lies in waste and the gates thereof are consumed with fire? Just want to pause there a second on that word gates. In scripture, the gates are of course, natural gates, the entry points into the cities, but they're much more than that. Most of you remember in the New Testament, Jesus said, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against my church. He wasn't talking about physical doorways. He was talking about places of authority. And so the gates of a city are indeed entry points and exit points for the city. But in ancient times, they were the, they were the, um, uh, they had multifaceted function. You remember that Absalom uh, in David's time sat at the gate and as the people would come to the city to present their case to the king, Absalom would interrupt them at the gate and listen to their case and say, if I was the king, this is what I would do. So the gates were places where there was a, uh, effectively like a magisterial court. Lower court cases were decided in the gates of the city. The gate was also where ple uh, people would be either allowed into the city or turned away from the city merchandise would be inspected and they'd say, you know, this fish that you've brought is, is rotten. It's not going to be allowed in our city. This animal's diseased. These things were, the protection was at the gate or the provision was allowed through the gate. So it was, it was much more than the doors getting in and out of this building or the, the gate owned of this property. There were governmental functions that took place at the gate. And so in the book of Nehemiah, 
uh, one of the main things he does is restore the gates, and the gates are mentioned by name in chapter 3. We'll look at that with a little detail, not too much tonight. So the king says in verse 4 of chapter 2, what do you make your request? What do you want? And then he throws up this, this prayer. He says, so I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said to the king, now just pause in your mind. He's, the king asks him, what's wrong with you? He says, my city's destroyed. The, kingdom says, what do, the king says, what do you want? And he says, so I prayed. How long do you think that prayer was? It was like, oh God, <laughs> help, you know, something like that. Maybe he cast his eyes to heaven. Whatever he prayed, it was like a micro prayer, you know. And so this, this begins the first of many Nehemiah really short prayers. This is probably the shortest one. But he said to the king, if I've found favor in your sight, that you would send me to Judah, to the city of my father's sepulchers, that I may build it. And the king said to me, and notice it says, the queen also sitting by him. And we don't know who that queen was, probably his wife, but it's an interesting notation that the queen is mentioned in the context of this in view of Esther, time frame wise too. For how long shall the journey be? How long shall your journey be and when you're going to return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I, I set him a time. I gave him an estimate how long it was going to be. In verse 8, and a letter uh, was sent to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he would give me timber to make beams for the gates of the palace and to the temple and to the wall of the city and for the house that I'd enter into. And the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. That's in verse 8. Remember last week I mentioned the fact that Ezra uses this expression, the hand of my God on me, the hand of God on me, the hand of God on them. And uh, we use it ourselves even to this day. One of the reasons we believe Ezra is the author of Nehemiah is this expression appearing again in Nehemiah, the hand of God, the hand of my God, or the good hand of my God being on me. And then there's some villains introduced that are going to kind of uh, follow the narrative. In chapter 2, verse 10, when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite, heard of it, it grieved them exceedingly that there was a man coming to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. Now notice that Sanballat and Tobiah, because these two men, especially Tobiah, are going to be tenacious in opposing uh, Nehemiah for years and years and years. This, uh, this Tobiah, um, we'll talk about him as a prototype of uh, someone that can infiltrate the work of the Lord or try to infiltrate the work of the Lord. So these guys were upset. In verse 11, he comes to Jerusalem. He was there um, for three days. He didn't tell anybody he was there. Verse 13, I went out by night by the gate of the valley. So the valley gate is mentioned. Even before the dragon well and to the dung gate and viewed the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down and the gates, which had been consumed with fire. Verse 14, then I went to the gate of the fountain of the fountain gate. And the king's pool, but there was no place for the, the uh, beast that was under me to pass. That was, it was so broken down that the, uh, the horse couldn't go under, or the camel, whatever it was. And I went up in the night by the brook and viewed the wall and turned back and entered by the valley, uh, the gate of the valley. And so returned. And the rulers didn't know where I went or what I did. I didn't tell anybody. Verse 17, then I said to them, you see the distress that we're in, how Jerusalem lies waste. And the gates are burned with fire. Come, let us build up the walls of Jerusalem so that we won't be a reproach anymore. Then I told them of the good hand of my God, which was good upon me, or the hand of my God, which was good upon me. And also the king's words that he had spoken to me. They said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened the hands for this good work. In verse 19, the villains, we need some scary music. Ooh, Sanballat, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the, the uh, servant, uh, the Ammonite, and Gershom, the Arabian, heard it. We got another villain, G Gershom, the Arabian. They laughed us to scorn, and they despised us. Verse 20, I answered them, and I said, the God of heaven, he will prosper us. Therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build. But you have no portion, nor right, nor memorial in Jerusalem. Now, these opponents. Whatever God's going to do in your life or anybody's uh, life, ministry, city, home, family, whatever, there's going to be opposition. 
It can arise from non-believers. Sometimes it can arise from believers. But the devil uses these opponents not often to physically harm us, but often to discourage us and dissuade us from doing whatever God has called us to do. And so um, uh, these guys are kind of prototypes of those who would oppose the purposes of God in your life, my life, your church, my church, your family, our family, etc. So we're going to look at some of the methods they use as we go through this. Now, chapter 3, I'm not going to read all these individually out of the text, but I'll tell you the verses. There's 10 gates mentioned in chapter 3. The first one is verse 1, the sheep gate. Chapter, um, all of these are in chapter 3. Verse 3, the fish gate. Verse 6, the old gate. Verse 13, the valley gate. These are in your notes. You don't have to write them down. Verse 14, the dung gate. Verse 15, the fountain gate. 26, the water gate. 28, the horse gate. 29, the eastern gate. And 31, uh, the mikpad or inspection gate. If you read in the book of Revelation, there are 12 gates on the city of Jerusalem. But here, 10 gates are listed on the, uh, on the city. I'll come back to that in a little bit. But the the... The gates, the walls around Jerusalem in Nehemiah's time are not the same walls that are around Jerusalem now. The gates that are there now, most of them have different names than these. The only gate that's the same now as it was then is the eastern gate, and it's sealed up. But the gates around the city of Jerusalem that have been unearthed or uh, restored in modern times were built in the Middle Ages. They were not built in this, uh, this time roughly 2,500 years ago. Again, with the exception being the eastern gate, which is probably above the gate that existed in Nehemiah's time. And so the sheep gate, it's obvious the sheep, it's on the, the Bethlehem side of the city where the sheep were kept. And this is where the, the sheep were brought through for sacrifice. Uh, of course, I don't think it was exclusively so, but generally so. Fish gate, self-explanatory. The old gate was a prior gate. Remember, Jerusalem had belonged um, to other people before David conquered the city and made it the city of David, so don't know the antiquity of that gate, but an older gate. The valley gate is um, leading probably to the Hinnom Valley. The Dung Gate is a little explanation. This is where the refuge went out of the city. And so if you remember Jesus in the time of Christ, he looked in the Hinnom Valley where the, the refuge was burned and he used that as a type of hell. He said, where the, uh, the worm dies not, where the fire goes out. This is where the refuge went out. And you've, all of you have seen a trash dump burning. You know, this was a perpetual burning trash dump that came out of this gate into the Hinnom Valley. And so Gehenna in the New Testament is a word that is meant, uh, used to mean hell. But it comes from the Hinnom Valley, Gehenna. So this dung gate was where all the trash went out. The fountain gate, the water gate, the horse gate, the eastern gate. The eastern gate is interesting to us for a lot of reasons, not the least of which that it's prophesied about that the Messiah will enter through the eastern gate. So hold your finger where you're at. Flip over to Ezekiel 44. Hold your finger in Nehemiah. Flip over to Ezekiel 44, verse 1. Um, somebody read verse 1 through 3. Read it loud. And so this was taken by the Jews and by us to be a messianic prophecy that the prince that's spoken of in Ezekiel's passages, um, chapter 41 through 48, is the Messiah. The, the Muslims, when they, con when they conquered Jerusalem uh, in the Middle Ages, they were aware of this prophecy. So what they did was they, they said, okay, if the guy's going to come 
and claim to be the Jewish Messiah. He's got to come through the eastern gate. They walled up the eastern gate and they put a graveyard, an Islamic graveyard, in front of the eastern gate because no Orthodox rabbi would step on a grave to go through a gate. So they set a division there intentionally to keep this passage from fulfilling. But of course we know that when Jesus touches down on the Mount of Olives, it's going to split anyway and that gate is not going to be a problem, neither is that graveyard you know, to the risen Lord Jesus Christ. But they're looking for a natural man to come with a political alliance, you know, and try to enter in through this gate. So if you go to Jerusalem today, this one gate is, is reestablished and uh, walled up with bricks with that graveyard in front of it. So back to chapter 3, this, these, um, uh, the inspection gate, um, this was reportedly where David would review his armies. So the, the nature of the inspection gate is somewhat disputed, but it's an interesting idea that armies going out to war would stop there. Everybody's seen the military films where the, the commander reviews the troops. This is where that would take place as they were going out. But these gates, there's a, um, a lot of books have been written about this chapter 3 of Nehemiah. If you have time sometime, you can look up um, on the Internet these various gates and the prophetic significance of them. There's a, some of it is silly, some of it's interesting. You know, the names in Hebrew, as you know, all have um, numerical values and so forth. Each, each uh, Hebrew letter has a number. And so the numerical significance of these gates um, have been gone into exhaustively with a number of books. But at the very least, Nehemiah very carefully talks about each of these gates, who restored them, how they restored them, and how long it took. He goes through the details of it very carefully. In chapter 4, it came to pass when Sanballat, one of the opponents, heard that we built the wall, he was angry and took great indignation and mocked the Jews. And he spoke before his brethren, the army of Samaria, and said, What do these feeble Jews think they're doing? Will they fortify themselves? Will they start sacrificing again at the temple? Will they make the end of all this in a day? Will they revive the stones out of heaps? out of the rubbish which is burned. Now Tobiah the Ammonite was by him, and he said, Even that which they build, if a fox went up on it, he would break down the stone wall. And so this, this discouragement, once again, you could try to do anything, somebody's going to discourage you. Sometimes a lot of people are going to discourage you from whatever the Lord has told you to do. So what's Nehemiah's response? It's one of these short prayers in verse 4 and 5. Listen to what he prays. Hear, O our God, for we are despised, and turn their reproach upon their own head, and give them for a prey in the land of captivity, and cover not their iniquity, and let not their sin be blotted out from before you, for they have provoked you to anger before the builders. Now, I wonder if he did that out loud in front of these guys. He may have. You know, this was a very bold guy, and he was the governor. But he, however he did it, he recorded this for us, and I'm not encouraging anybody to pray this way, but he did it, and David did it. It's, uh, it's in the scriptures for our instruction. So they kept building the wall, and uh, in verse 7, it came to pass when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabian and the others heard they were very angry. Verse 8, they conspired all of them to come and fight against Jerusalem to hinder it. Nevertheless, we made our prayer unto our God. And set a watch against them day and night because of them. So both the natural and the spiritual. They put guards out to watch for the bad guys and they prayed. It's not they just said, well, God's going to take care of it. No, they did both. They did what was right and prudent to do uh, in the natural and they prayed. It, it would be like if you lived in a, a very high crime zone and you said, well, I'm just going to trust God and leave my house unlocked and leave my key in my car. I'm just going to trust God. That wouldn't be prudent, right? So you don't necessarily have to sit in the window with a shotgun, but you do have to do what's reasonable uh, in the sight of God and pray. So that's what they did. In verse 12, And it came to pass, when the Jews, which dwelt near these bad guys, came, they said to us ten times, From all places, uh, when she return, they will be upon you. Therefore, this is Nehemiah now. I said in the lower places behind the wall and on the higher places, I set people after their families with swords, their spears, and bows. So they were threatened ten times. They had ten warnings of retribution from these opponents. 
And he looked up and said to everybody in verse 14, about the middle of the verse, be not afraid of them. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible and fight for your brothers and sisters and your daughters, your wives and your houses. And so he's encouraging the people um, contrary to the opposition. In verse 16, it came to pass from that time forth that half of the servants uh, worked on the work and the other half held spears, shields, bows and, and body armor. And the rulers were behind all the house of Judah. And so they had, they split the team. Okay, you, you half over here, you're going to build. You half over there, you're going to stand behind them with your weapons and back them up. And then you'll switch off. Verse 17, they which built on the wall and they that bore burdens, those loaded everyone with his hands, wrought the work. And the other hand held a weapon. For the weapons, every one had his sword, for the builders, everyone had his sword by his side as he built. So even the people that were building were ready if they were attacked. They're prepared to fight, agreed, from the text. They're expecting trouble. But notice what what Nehemiah says in verse 20. In what place, therefore, that you hear the trumpet, resort there to us, our God shall fight for us. In other words, if they attack on the far side of the city, come running with your weapons, but our God's going to fight for us. We got to fight too, but our God's going to fight for us. And sometimes we as Christians... Once again, we just think, uh, yeah, the battle belongs to the Lord. We don't have to do anything. But Scripture says we've got to withstand evil as well and stand in the day of trouble and uh, resist the devil, etc. Verse 21, so we labored in the work and half of them held the spears from rising of the morning till the stars appeared. So they worked um, all day, every day. Chapter 5, chapter 5, there's an interesting insertion about usury. And I want to talk about that for a second. So there was a, apparently when the Jews had come back, there were Jewish money lenders that had loaned the Jewish people money at interest. And so the net result was when they came back to reclaim their inheritance, a lot of their inheritance had to be mortgaged to these money lenders. So verse one, there was a great cry of the people and of their wives against the brethren, their brethren, the Jews. For there were said that our sons and daughters are many, and we've taken up corn for them so that we may eat and live. Some also were there that have said, we've mortgaged our lands, our vineyards, our houses, so that we might buy food uh, because of the, the, the need. Verse 4, there were also that said, we have borrowed money for the king's tribute, or our taxes, upon our land and vineyards. And so this this money borrowing and um uh, it goes on into verse 6 and 7 to talk about they were exacting usury. Some of you are, are familiar with that term usury. This is a, we, live in a, we live in a culture where it's common to borrow money. Amen? Credit cards, whatever. And if you borrow money, you pay interest. But biblically, there is not a partial prohibition to charging interest. There's a complete prohibition to charging interest. In other words, one Jew was not allowed to charge another Jew interest on a loan. They could take security. They could hold your coat, your land, or whatever until it was paid back, but they couldn't charge interest. Now, they developed a whole rabbinic workaround for this, but biblically, they're not allowed to charge each other interest. They determined it was okay to charge non-Jews interest, but that was a rabbinic determination. It's not a biblical determination. So this idea of Um, The borrower is the slave to the lender from Proverbs and so forth. This is a Jewish concept that holds out through the Torah, through the writings of Moses. And and Nehemiah is very upset about this deal. So in verse 6, he says, I was very angry when I heard their cry in these words. Then I consulted with myself and I rebuked the nobles and the rulers and said to them, you exact usury, every one of his brother. And I said a great assembly against them. And uh, he continued to, to uh, instruct them. And then verse 10, he finally just commands them to stop charging usury. Verse 11, restore to them even this day their lands, their vineyards, their olive yards, their horses, also um, uh, the hundredth part of the money, 1%, and of the corn and wine and oil that you have taken from them. Then they said, will we restore them and will we require nothing? So we will do as you have said. Then I called the priest and took, made him take an oath 
that they would do this. Verse 13, I shook my lap and said, so God shake out every man from his house and from his labor and perform, who performs not this promise. And then it goes on to say the people did according to the promise. So, you know, not only was it, was Ezra and Nehemiah calling them back from the intermarriage with strange wives or husbands that worshiped other gods, they were calling them back to the original intent of Moses with these things like usury, loaning money. I, um, uh, I am not in any way of this mindset, but a lot of people think hard of Jewish people because of the practice of money lending and uh, interest, because they are known historically as money lenders, you know, in good times or bad, and, and uh, uh, international bankers and so forth. And if they, had ab- abide, if they had been careful to abide by the law of Moses, that particular accusation wouldn't have troubled them. Anyway, uh, in verse 14, it says, From the time I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, from the 20th year even to the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, that's 12 years, I and my brothers have not eaten bread of the governor, but I myself provided the food. So he provided the food for, for all of the workers and so forth. In verse 19, he throws up one of these prayers. Now listen to this verse 19, because think about yourself with this. He calls God to remember the good things he's done. He says, think upon me, my God, for good, according to all that I have done for this people. I, I've never prayed a prayer like that. Have any of y'all prayed anything like that? It sounds like it's, it sounds almost inappropriate, but it's not. It's in the Bible. He just basically says, hey, God, pay attention. This is what I did. Don't you remember? Did you see? It's, it's an interesting, he had an interesting relationship with God, you know? That's my observation of it. I think it's cool. Okay, chapter 6, more, more, more schemes, lots of schemes to derail the work. In verse 1, it came to pass when Sanballat and Tobiah and the, the Arabian, Gershom the Arabian, uh, saw that the, the wall was built up and there was no breach left therein, but they hadn't yet set up the doors of the gates, that Sanballat and Gershom sent unto me saying, Come, let's meet together in one of the villages in the plain. But they thought to do me mischief. And so he recognized that these guys were opposing the work of God, but they've they've ramped it up now from just discouraging words to actually trying to lure him into a trap. In verse 3, he sent messengers to them saying, I'm doing a great work, so I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave and come down to you? At verse 3, how many of you here are familiar with Reinhard Bonnke? Reinhard Bonnke? Reinhard Bonnke is a, um, a German evangelist is famous for his work in Africa, crowds sometimes exceeding a million people. But he, there was a season of time where he was reviled in his home country of Germany. There was a big outcry, and people were ashamed that he's doing all these, these uh, um, ministry things in Africa, and, and uh, uh, the miracles that he was claiming were taking place. Anyway, he was catching a lot of flack back in Germany. Germany, if you don't know, has a state church. Germany has a, the Lutheran church as the state church, and the pastors are actually government employees. They get a check from the government of Germany. If you're a Lutheran church pastor, you get a check from the government of, of uh, Germany. And so these, these pastors, not all of them, but they were offended with Bonnke. And so the newspapers were full of articles, negative articles about the guy. And he was asked in Africa, are you going to go back to Germany and answer all these accusations? And his response sounded like this verse. Nehemiah said, I'm doing a great work, so I shouldn't come down and let the work cease while I leave it and come down to them. Reinhard Bonnke said, the Lord has given me a, a, a vast harvest. Should I leave the harvest field and go back and argue with these men about whether it's right or wrong to lead men to Christ? And so his, his response was, I'm staying in Africa and preaching the gospel. Y'all can just saber rattle back in Germany. Now in due season, most of those same men that opposed him come, came to love him and be very proud of him. But he went through that period of time and he just refused to go back and deal with it. He just said, I'm not going not to bother. I'm busy. <laughs> they sent to him four times. They sent to Nehemiah four times, it says in verse 4, four different plots. Um, trying to get him out away from the, the work. 
Verse 5, then Sanballat has ser- sent his servant to me in the like manner with an open letter in his hand. And the letter said, it's reported among the heathen. And Gashmusheth, Gashmu says that you, the Jews, think to rebel. For which cause you're building the wall that you may be their king according to these words. Now, once again, this is a new accusation. He's talking about a government insurrection, and the Persians didn't take any prisoners. And so, um, uh, this is a pretty serious accusation. Verse 8, Then I sent to him, saying, There are no such things done as you've said, but you have feigned them out of your own heart. You made this up. For they all made us afraid, saying, Their hands will be weakened from the work, that it be not done. And then another one of these one-liner prayers, the end of verse 9. Now, therefore, O God, strengthen my hands. His response to their attack, God, you saw, now strengthen my hands. By the way, I hope you all are adopting some of these prayers. They're really good short prayers when you're being harassed by the, by the principalities and powers or by people that are trying to thwart the purposes of God. In verse 10, afterwards, um, he came to the house of Shemaiah. And um, uh, who said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple. Let us shut the doors of the temple. For they're going to come and kill you in the night. They will come to kill you. Verse 11, I said, should should, should such a man as I flee? And who is there that being as I am would go into the temple to save his own life? I will not go in there and hide. And I perceived that God had not sent him. But he had pronounced this prophecy against me, for Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. So there's these guys again. Especially take note of Tobiah, because after all the others are gone, Tobiah is still going to be hanging around harassing him. So he wasn't wasn't, um, taking the bait to go hide in the temple to save his life. In verse 14, another prayer. My God, think upon Tobiah and Sanballat according to these their works. And on the prophetess, Noadiah, and the rest of the prophets that would have put me in fear. So apparently there's some kind of false prophets that are um, linked into this conspiracy, working with the Samaritans and those that are around the non-Jews trying to finish, uh, make them stop. And so verse 15, the wall was finished. In the 25th day of the month of Elul in 52 days. So in spite of all this opposition, I didn't count the plots, did y'all? I mean, we're talking 15, 20 different plots. In 52 days, the wall was built, no matter what they did, because they stayed single-minded and focused, and they continued to move forward, uh, defend themselves, and pray. And so um, uh, it says in verse 16, at the end of the verse, they perceived that this work was done by our God. So this 52-day building project was impossible. Now, just a, a little aside from the text. When y'all get a chance sometimes, I've got all kind of reference books. There's a lot of them in the library, but you can look online. If you go to look up the, uh, the old city of Jerusalem, the city of David, the uh, city of Nehemiah, Nehemiah's day, there's all kinds of different variations of the shape of these walls. We don't know the exact geography of these walls. And so some of them you'll find that look almost like a figure eight set up. Some of them are kind of square looking. Some are kind of oval. Some are kind of round. The truth is they haven't unearthed this particular layer to the point where they know exactly what the dimensions were of these walls. So it's interesting, but however big it was, this was still in ancient times a major city. And so to restore the walls of a major ancient city in 52 days, I don't care if you've got all the workmen of Egypt, that's a major accomplishment. Regardless of which map you look at, this is a huge undertaking that they did in the midst of physical opposition with people with weapons. So it is indeed a, the work of the Lord that they were able to accomplish. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Verse 17, moreover, in those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters to Tobiah And the letters of Tobiah came to them. So now, Tobiah is trying to go around Nehemiah to the aristocrats among the Jews. 
He's trying, okay, I wasn't able to oppose him with swords and spears and plots to murder him. Now I'm going to go after him with politics. And so this um, Tobiah becomes very sneaky trying to seduce the Jewish leadership beyond Nehemiah. And he's somewhat effective at it. Um, And it says in verse 18, For there were many in Judah sworn to him, because he was a son-in-law of Shekiah, Shekiniah, um, who was a prominent guy. So he, apparently he was married to a Jewess. Verse 19, also they reported his good deeds before me and uttered my words to him. So there were spies in Nehemiah's camp. And Tobiah sent letters to put me in fear. So this guy's still trying to manipulate. Even though the city wall's built, he's harassing Nehemiah, God's man. Now I'm in chapter 7. Let me turn my page in the notes here. By God's grace, we'll finish Nehemiah tonight, as I said, and do Ezra next week. I mean, uh, Esther next week. So in chapter 7, there's new leadership appointed. In in verse 1, it says, Now it came to pass, when the wall was built, and I had set up the doors and the porters and the singers and the Levites were appointed, that I gave my brother Hanani, And Hananiah, the ruler of the palace, charge over Jerusalem, for he was a faithful man and feared God. So he set this guy in place. Remember, Nehemiah still is a government official back in Sushan. So he's traveling back and forth from this point forward. In verse 3, I said to them, let not the gates of Jerusalem be opened until the sun be hot. While they stand by, let him shut the doors and bar them and appoint watchmen of the inhabitants of Jerusalem, everyone on his watch, everyone to be over against his house. So he's charging them to be careful. And then in... Because he wanted to be able to see who was coming and going very carefully so they couldn't let the enemy sneak in at night. Um, In verse uh, 5, And God put into my heart to gather the nobles and the rulers of the people that they might be reckoned by genealogy. And I found a register of the genealogy which had come up at first that was written there. And so this verse 6 and following is the genealogy of Ezra chapter 2. It's recorded in Ezra chapter 2 verse 1 and following. Verse 1 of Ezra 2 is almost identical. The genealogy is identical. It's just recorded a second time in chapter 7. I'm not going to read that. But it's interesting to note that in the Bible they recorded each of these people's names for antiquity, you know, for all of time, from antiquity for all of time. When you get to the bottom line in verse 66 and 67, it's the same totals that appeared in Nezra, with the exception of the singing men and women. In Ezra, there were 200 singing men and women. Now there's 245. I don't know how they got a few more singing men and women, but they did. Uh, you got to have more singing men and women, I guess, as time goes on. It's a big choir. It's a big choir. These are priests, Levites. And so chapter 8, I'm just going to jump over to chapter 8. So all the people gathered together as one man in the street that was in front of the water gate, and they spoke to Ezra the scribe. And as I said, Ezra is a contemporary. This is where he enters the narrative with Nehemiah being the governor and Ezra the, the spiritual leader. To bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded Israel. And so Ezra brought the book out so everybody could hear it. In verse 3, he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from morning till midday before the men and the women, so that those that could understand and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And so this public reading of the scriptures, and it's mentioned in Ezra as well. In verse 5, And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. They set up some kind of uh, dais, a raised platform of some sort. He was above all the people, and when he opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And all the people answered, Amen and Amen, with lifting up of their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. So I just want to unpack that a little bit. The the lifting of the hands was a traditional Hebraic form of worship, uh, adoration. One of the words that we use is, the English word praise means to lift your hands. And it says, with their faces to the ground. The most common word that's translated in English as worship literally means to get on your face before God. In the New Testament, you know where the, uh, the elders in Revelation cast their crowns down and 
uh, lie before the Lord, uh, this, this leg before the Lord. The word that's used for, for worship in the New Testament where the elders lie, the same word that's used in the Old Testament in Hebrew, the equivalent word, means to get on your face before a holy God. So very few times in a Christian context will you see the people moved on to get on their face before God. But in the scriptures, many times the people are moved to get on their face before a holy God. I'm not suggesting we do that right now. I'm just saying, I'm pointing out the obvious. They had a, a deeper sense of reverence in, than many of us do. You know, it was not alien to them to get on their face before God. You remember, this was a culture with absolute monarchs, too. If you were in the presence of an absolute monarch, you got on your face on the risk of your life if you didn't do it. And so it was nothing for you to, if you're in the presence of the Almighty, culturally, you were used to, to bowing to uh, power and authority, and it was easily transferred to the Lord, who deserved it. You know, the human authorities did not. And so when you hear the word worship in the Bible, when you hear praise music and worship music, worship music doesn't mean sing a slow song. It means to get on your, to worship God means to get on your face before a holy God. The, the word that's used with the elders in Revelation has a side meaning like a dog fawning and licking his master's hand. This is the image of those 24 elders that if any one of them showed up on the planet in, in physical form, the whole planet would flee from them. With God, it's like a dog licking at his master's, fawning at his master's side, licking his hand. See the picture. So for them, worship meant something much different than singing a slow song. So the people lifted up their hands with, and they worshiped with their faces to the ground. That's the proper position. In verse 9, Nehemiah, which is Tir Shatha, and Ezra the priest, the scribe, and the Levites that taught the people said to all the people, This day is holy unto the Lord your God. Don't mourn or weep. For all the people were weeping when they heard the words of the law that Ezra was reading. He said to them, Go your way, uh, eat, drink, um, send portions to them for whom nothing has been prepared. This day is a holy day to the Lord. Don't be sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. This is a day of celebration. And so on the second day, they, they did a repeat in verse 14, they found written in the law which Moses had commanded the children of Israel that Israel should dwell in booths in the feast of the seventh month. Now, this is talking about the Feast of Tabernacles. Apparently, while they were in Babylonian captivity and while they were in Persian captivity, dispersed from the land, there was no observation of the Feast of Tabernacles. Beyond that, we're going to read in the text that it had not been officially celebrated till the time, since the time of Joshua. And so even though Moses very carefully said, these three feasts shall you uh, follow annually, apparently they'd fallen into disuse. Remember, we've already talked about some uh, resurrected Passover celebrations. We'll have more as we're going forward. So the people, verse 16, the people went forth. They brought themselves and made booths or tents. Remember tabernacles, they made tents. And these were probably made out of sticks and things and branches. In verse 17, all the congregation of them that were come out of the captivity made booths and sat under the booths. For since the days of Joshua, the son of Nun, to that day had not the children of Israel done so. And there was very great gladness. So it was either not observed at all or not observed properly from the time of Joshua till this, which is approximately a thousand years. That's a big break, isn't it? Big, big time off. If you look in your notes under Ezra, um, uh, Nehemiah 8, I have a quote there from Deuteronomy 16. This is the direction for what became known as the pilgrimage feast. It says, three times a year shall all your males appear before the Lord your God in the place he shall choose. This is before Jerusalem was established. In the feast of unleavened bread... And the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of Weeks is Pentecost, the Feast of Unleavened Bread is Passover, and the Feast of Tabernacles. And they shall not appear before the Lord empty. This is talking about empty-handed. So these three feasts of the seven major feasts of Israel, these three feasts became known as the pilgrimage feasts. And the, the scriptures say that the males have to go to the place the Lord will cause his name to be honored. 
And so this, in this case, it's Jerusalem. This is their, they are uh, reinitiating this. They haven't been able to do it while they've been in captivity, but they're reinstituting this. So they kept the feast um, uh, eight days, solemn assembly, chapter 9. Now on the 24th day of the month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting and sackcloths and earth upon them. And the seed of Israel separated themselves from all the strangers and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. There's that vicarious repentance again. They're, they're taking a position of repentance. They stood up in the place and they read from the book of the law of the Lord their God one fourth part of the day and another fourth part of the day they confessed their sins and worshiped their God. And so they, uh, uh, I don't know what the, the marking was. I'm assuming three hours would be the the fourth part of the day, that's my guess. They probably call it a 12-hour day. So they had three hours of repentance, three hours of worship. Pretty good service. I like that. It's interesting. They preceded the, the worship with the repentance, confessed their sins and worship. In verse 5, the Levites, and names a bunch of Levites, um, said, Stand up and bless the Lord your God forever and ever. Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. Thou, even thou, art the Lord alone, and you've made heaven the heaven of heavens. Now, this chapter 9, they start to recount some of Israel's history, and they call for um, a renewal of the covenant, in essence. So let me just, let me just go some of this, the highlights of Israel's history that's, that's um, claimed here. So creation in verse 6, talking about the making the heavens and earth. In verse 7, you're the Lord God who chose Abraham. And brought him forth of your of the Chaldeans. Chaldeans, how many of you know that uh, uh, Hebrew and Chaldean are very similar? You see concordances, it says Hebrew and Chaldean. Chaldean is Babylonian. And so Arabic and Hebrew came out of Babylon, the language. Both language streams came out of the same source, this Chaldean. Gave him the name of Abraham. You found his heart faithful before you. In verse 10, you showed signs and wonders to Pharaoh. Verse 11, you divided the sea before them so that they went through the midst of the sea on dry land. Verse 12, moreover, you led them by day with a cloudy pillar and in the night by a pillar of fire to give them light in the way they should go. Verse 13, you came down also on Mount Sinai and delivered them commandments and judgments and statutes. In verse 14, you made known to them the Holy Sabbath gave them your precepts and statutes and laws by the hand of Moses. And you gave them bread from heaven for their hunger, the manna, of course. You brought forth rock, uh, water from the rock for their thirst. Joe, is it getting hot in here? Is it my imagination? I'm hot. You're cold? Are you rusty all cold? I'm burning up. I come out of the sweater. I take the sweater off, but I better not take the mic off. So you visitors from New Mexico, it's web stream, so the mic is not for y'all, it's for the webcast. How did y'all hear about us, by the way? My daughter was just up the road, and we were going to spend a lot of time with this grandchild. Oh, good, congratulations. You saw some lights. Well, good for you. That's good. Well, from Calvary Chapel, I listened to Chuck Smith on the radio for many years. Yeah, I love his teaching. Okay. Well, I listened to him on the radio, and now here I'm on the radio in Washington, D.C. Metro. Many years after I listened to Chuck, I do it myself. So I'm on, in this area, Christian radio is, um, the most powerful Christian radio station is Wava FM. So I'm on at 6 a.m. going through the Bible, kind of like what Chuck used to do, as a matter of fact. No, that's right. So just for your information, we have Tuesday night prayer in the other building. We have a Wednesday night Bible study here. We have a Friday uh, morning Bible study in the library, the same complex over there a couple doors over. That's at 10 a.m. on Friday mornings, and then 10.30 a.m. main sanctuary Sunday service. 
So you can find all that on the internet, but just kind of letting you know, we're back and forth between the two buildings. So if you don't, if you know there's supposed to be a service and you don't see anybody over there, we're over here and vice versa. You're welcome. Okay. And so continuing the history, uh, verse 16 of chapter nine, but they and our fathers dealt proudly and hardened their necks and hearkened not to your commandments and they refused to obey. Verse 18, yea, when they had made them a molten calf and said, this is your God that brought you up out of Egypt and had wrought great provocations, yet you and your manifold mercies didn't forsake them for the, in the wilderness. The pillar of cloud departed not from them by day to lead them in the way, neither the pillar of fire by night to show them the light. In verse 20, you also gave your good spirit to instruct them and withheld not your manna. Now, that, what good spirit would that be, by the way? Friends, help me with that. If, that's right. There's only one good spirit that the Lord gives. It's the Holy Spirit. So he gave his Holy Spirit to them to instruct them. Verse 21, yes, 41, 40 years did you sustain them in the wilderness so that they lacked nothing. Verse 22, moreover, you gave them kingdoms and nations. Verse 23, their children are multiplied as the stars of heaven. You brought them into the promised land. Verse 26, nevertheless, they were disobedient and rebelled against you and cast your law behind their backs and slew your prophets, which testified against them to turn them uh, to you. And they wrought great provocations. Verse 30, yet many years did you forbear with them and testify against them by your spirit in your prophets. Yet would they not give ear? They wouldn't listen. Therefore, you gave them into the hand of the people of the lands. He's talking about the judgment they're coming out of now. Verse 33, Howbeit you are just, and that um, in all that is brought upon us, for you have done right, but we have done wickedly. Neither have our kings, our princes, our priests, nor our fathers kept thy law, nor hearkened to your commandments and your testimonies, that you did testify against them. And I know I'm skipping a lot, but there's a lot here. The final verse of that chapter 9, verse 38. Because of all this, we're now going to make a covenant and write it, and our princes and Levites and priests are going to seal it. So they're going to enter into another covenant agreement. They're, they're basically ratifying the covenant of Moses, the Sinai covenant. He's gone through the, uh, the episodes of Israel's history. And so it lists uh, those that signed the document first in chapter 10, and then it gives a, um, a little bit of the details of what they've agreed to toward the end of chapter um, 10. So look at uh, verse 29. So all the people signed on to this document. And they clung to their brothers, the nobles, and entered into a curse and into an oath to walk in God's law, which was given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe and do all the commandments of the Lord our God and his judgments and his statutes, and that we would not give our daughters to the people of the land, nor take their daughters for our sons. And if the people of the land bring um, where or any victuals, the King, the King James says on the Sabbath day, you're not supposed to bring merchandise to sell on the Sabbath, is what it's talking about, food or whatever, that we would not buy them on the Sabbath or on the holy day and that we would leave the seventh year um, and the exaction of every debt, the um, no usury. So they're going to observe the Sabbath years. Remember we talked last week that Jeremiah prophesied they would be cast out of the land for 70 years in fulfillment of them having gone 490 years observing no Sabbath year. So 70 years was a um, a seventh of the 490 years they'd been in the land and not observed the Sabbath. So now they're swearing they're going to um, uh, observe a Sabbath year. By the way, do you all know how observant Jews, uh, farmers observe Sabbath year in Israel? Does anybody know how they do that? Yeah, they divide their land into seven sections. And so six sections they plant this year, then they move to the other, they, they change one of the sections the next year. They let one section of the land rest a year, not the whole farm for a year. You follow me? But they did, the, the religious kibbutzes have instituted that seven-year rotation of land. 
in fulfillment, in its attempt to fulfill the scripture. You might think it's a workaround, but I, I like it kind of. You know, I like the way they do it. Yeah, yeah I mean, Mary is a, uh, has a kind of a farm background. So, yeah, it does have a restorative effect to the land, but it also is dependent upon God. You know, it doesn't. In the natural, you would think, I've got to plant everything I can plant from antiquity. They didn't have the science and all involved in it, but the faith was in God to supply. Without explaining it, exactly what he was doing. You're right. And so they also agreed um, uh, in verse 32, this is part of what they swore to. We made ordinances for ourselves to charge ourselves yearly. The third part of a shekel for the service of the house of our God. This is the temple tax. Does everybody remember in Matthew 17 when some of the, the Jewish religious leaders came to Peter and said, does your master pay the temple tax? This is the tax. And so they, it was laid out in the, ta- in the um, uh, writings of Moses, but it had been abandoned. And so they reinstituted the temple tax. And by the way, in Matthew 17, 24, Jesus paid it, but he paid it with a coin in the mouth of a fish. He said, Peter, go and catch it. This is where Peter's fish comes from. The story of Peter's fish is paying the temple tax. And so they are agreeing to pay the temple tax in verse 35 and to bring the first fruits of the ground the first fruits of all the fruit of the trees. This is the tithe of the, of the land. Also the firstborn of our sons and our cattle. Remember the Lord said all the firstborn belong to him. They could redeem them with money or they could turn them over to the temple. In verse 37, that we should bring the first fruits of our dough and our offerings, the fruit of all manner of trees and wine and oil to the priest and the chambers. Anyway, they're, they're reinstituting the tithe. In verse 39, for the children of Israel and the children of Levi shall bring the offering of the corn and the new wine and the oil to the chambers where are the vessels of the sanctuary and the priests that minister and the porters and the singers. We will not forsake the house of our God. And so they were, they were basically ratifying the existing covenant, but they were publicly declaring, we're going to live by these things again. Um, in chapter 11, it talks about the city residents. Remember, they're returning to a, a, a decimated country, not just a decimated city. So in the first couple of verses, they decide that one out of 10 people are going to live in Jerusalem, and the other nine are going to live in other parts of the country. Chapter 11, verse 1, the rulers of the people dwelt at Jerusalem. The rest of the people cast lots to bring one out of 10 to dwell in Jerusalem, the holy city, and nine parts to dwell in other cities. And so the people blessed all the men, willingly offered themselves to dwell at Jerusalem. Uh, just another quick aside, it's not a sin to cast lots. You know, I've heard people say that's gambling, it's a, you know, it's a sin or whatever. It's in the Bible. And if you, you have a problem because they cast lots for the robe of Christ, they also cast lots to decide who Judas's replacement would be. You might not like the pick they made, but I don't think all the apostles were in sin when they were trying to cast lots. It was not, a, not an issue theologically. Okay, so they, they um, just list who goes to what cities in chapter 11. Let's go to chapter 12. Chapter 12 and 13 are the last two chapters. Chapter 13, it mentions the priest and the Levites uh, that went up with Zerubbabel, the first group, and then the, the other group. In verse 26, it said, These were in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Yeshua, the son of Josadak, in the days of Nehemiah, the governor of Ezra the priest, the scribe. And at the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, they sought the Levites out of all their places to bring them to Jerusalem, to keep the dedication with gladness, both with thanksgiving and with singing, with cymbals and psalteries and harps. And Joe, this, uh, this next part that I'm coming to, I was thinking about this for us. We ought to do this on the property sometime soon. In verse um, 31, I brought up the princes of Judah upon one wall and appointed two great companies of them that gave thanks. And one went to the right toward the dung gate. And um, in verse 38, the other group of them gave thanks, went over against them. So he, what he did was, he set two groups of people back to back on the walls to walk on the walls 
and give thanks and then to come meet together on the other side. We ought to do that on the property sometime. We ought to get out in the front of the place and walk the perimeter and meet in the very back. You know, one Sunday, just get whoever's willing, and just walk and pray and praise the Lord and thank God. And it's, uh, I like it. I like it. We'll, do, we'll wait. It gets a little warmer, but we'll do it before the bugs come back into the woods. Yeah, maybe so. Maybe so. Maybe so. And so they, um, uh, they did this in verse 9. It mentions uh, the gate of Ephraim and the old gate and above the fish gate. The gate of Ephraim is not mentioned in chapter 3. So this may be yet another gate. And then it mentions the prison gate in verse 39, which may be an internal gate or another external gate. There were internal gates and external gates. So these two may be internal gates. In verse 40, so stood the two companies of them that gave thanks in the house of God, and I in the half of the rulers with me. Uh, verse 42 says, The singers sang loud. <laughs> verse 43, All that day they offered great sacrifices and rejoiced, for God had made them rejoice with great joy. The wives also and the children rejoiced, so that the joy of Jerusalem was heard even far off. I bet it was. In verse 46, for in the days of David and Asaph of old, there were chief of the singers and songs of praise and thanksgiving to God. And all Israel in the days of Zerubbabel and in the days of Nehemiah gave the portions of the singers and the porters. Every day is portion. They paid worshipers. Excuse me. And they sanctified holy things unto the Levites and the Levites sanctified them to the children of Aaron. In verse 13, chapter 13, the Jews responded um, more. On that day they read in the book of Moses in the audience of the people. And there was found that the Ammonite and the Moabite should not come into the congregation of God forever. Let's just pause there for a second. Remember the book of Ruth. And Ruth was a Moabite. But Ruth was adopted into the family of God as a Jew. In other words, you could come from another nationality and be accepted into Judaism if you would become a worshiper of the God of Israel. It was not a matter of what you were born as. It was a matter of who you worshipped. And so the, uh, the prohibition against M uh, uh, Moabites was for them worshiping among the people of God as outsiders, not worshiping among the people of God as people of God. Um, was, it, was it here last week? We were talking about, um, I, I think it was here last week. I made a comment that there's um, Jews in, in a, virtually every ethnic group you can think of. And I said there's even Chinese Jews. Who was it that questioned that last week? Who was it? Simon. Somebody was questioning that, and they started looking up on the Internet, and they found Chinese-looking Jews. But Jew, we think in our mindset, Jew is an ethnic group. Jew is not an ethnic group. You know, they, they're, you can say they're Semitic-looking people, and a lot of Jews are Semitic-looking, but they look like Arabs do as well. But there's Jews that look like, you name a people group, they look like that because they're Jews, you know. Okay. Verse 3, Now it came to pass when they heard the law that they separated Israel from all the mixed multitude, before this, Eliashib the priest, having oversight of the chamber of the house of our God, was allied to Tobiah. So this guy who had um, oversight of the storerooms of the temple had been seduced by this Tobiah who had been opposing the work. Remember, he was writing letters and making nice with everybody. He's a, he's a snake, but he's a, he's a political snake. He wasn't able to intimidate him, so he infiltrated him and became seemingly a friend and an ally. But Nehemiah was able to see through it. And this guy who had um, uh, authority over the temple treasury areas, he prepared for Tobiah a great apartment. He, he laid out a big apartment for him. and had all kinds of servants and everything for this, uh, this reprobate in the temple. Verse 6, But in all that time, this is Nehemiah speaking now, I wasn't at Jerusalem. For in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, the king of Babylon, I came to the king after certain days and obtained leave of the king, and I came to Jerusalem. And I understood the evil that Eliashib did 
for Tobiah in preparing him a chamber in the courts of the house of God. So this guy wasn't satisfied just to be in Jerusalem. He was in the temple itself. This sounds like the devil around the throne of God or what? And so it grieved me. Therefore, I cast out all the household stuff of Tobiah out of the chamber. And I commanded that they clean the chambers. And I brought again the vessels of the house of God with meat offerings and frankincense. And I perceived the portions of the Levites had not been given them. For the Levites and the singers uh, that did the work were not being paid. And so he, he brought everything up to date with cleansing it and paying everybody. Throws up another little prayer in verse 14. Remember me, O my God, concerning this. And wipe not out my good deeds that I have done for the house of my God. And for the offices thereof, for the services. What dinged? Was that my thing here? That was yours. Okay. So every now and again, I'm teaching in this thing here. I'll say Syria, and it goes, Siri answers. <laughs> or I'll say Assyrian. If I say it wrong, it comes up. I've had to slap it a couple of times when I'm preaching. So um, he testified against them and got all those things straightened out. And uh, in verse 16, men of Tyre were bringing fish in and all kinds of things to sell on the Sabbath. And uh, Nehemiah straightened that out. He contended with the nobles of Judah and said, what are you doing allowing uh, these profaning of the Sabbath, selling these things? And um, uh, he, he instituted that the gates would be shut uh, before dark on the Sabbath and then opened after the Sabbath so no commerce could take place. He testified against them. In verse 22, he commanded the Levites that they should cleanse themselves ceremonially. They should come and keep the gates to sanctify the Sabbath day. Another little short prayer in verse 22, just part of verse 22. Remember me, O my God, concerning this also, and spare me according to the greatness of your mercy. And then um, uh, he, he contends with the intermarried group, made them put away their wives um, verse 29, another short prayer. Remember them, O my God, for they have defiled the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood and the Levites. Thus I cleanse them from all strangers. And then the last phrase of chapter 13, remember me, O my God, for good. You know, one of these days I'm going to take all of his little short prayers and just compile them in a row. But there's a lot of Hey, God, did you see that? Hey, God, did you see what I did? Hey, God, don't forget what I did. <laughs> it's, uh, it sounds kind of selfish, but uh, it's in the Bible for our instruction. So in, the, in your private prayers, I don't think it would be a problem. You probably wouldn't want to pray these prayers in public. I don't think people would understand them. <laughs> Especially the imprecatory ones when you're calling down retribution on the enemies of God. Now... Next week, before I close, and uh, when I close, we'll pray for anybody who's like prayer. The book of Esther is only 10 chapters long. It's a very short book. I want you to read it as it's written, um, which, of course, you would. But we're going to read it. Every, every book of the Bible can be read on many layers. And so we'll read it as it was to the original recipients. This book Esther was unique in that it was circulated, much of it was circulated throughout the known world in the time in which it was written. In other words, the events that play out in Esther were sent by um, imperial edict to the ends of the earth announcing what was taking place. And so it says over and over again, in every language, 127 languages, Esther played out in real time. So the original recipients saw this thing a certain way. We'll go through it as the original recipients saw it. And then we're going to approach the book of Esther from a, um, a Christ-centered look at it as a paradigm of our relationship with Jesus. And I'll explain all that next week. But as you read it, read it um, with a first century or with an um, original recipient mindset. But keep in the back of your mind, this speaks to us about our relationship with Jesus. And we'll review these 10 chapters next week. Amen. Any questions on Nehemiah before I close? Nothing? Nada? All right. If anybody needs prayer after I close, then we're going to hang around and pray with you. And Joe and I will pray for anybody that would like prayer. So, Father, we thank you for Nehemiah. Lord, we thank you for the instruction that we're not to be discouraged by those that um, 
write letters, those that um, insult us, those that even threaten us, Lord, if we're about your business and indeed have heard from you and how to proceed, Lord, we should proceed and uh, in wisdom, Lord, um, guarding ourselves, but also praying for you to guard us as well. Lord, may we not lose sight of this rebuilding of the wall, how it was done with your help and with the people with hard work. And the same things can be accomplished in our day. We thank you, Lord, that the walls of Jerusalem the city of Jerusalem um, have stood in ruins and yet they're being rebuilt even in our generation. We ask you, Lord, that they would be rebuilt to the honor and glory of the God of Israel and to the Son of God, our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we ask that he would be raised up and worshiped on that temple mount in this very city that Nehemiah rebuilt. We ask you all these things, Lord, and please remind us not to despise the value of short prayers. Lord, may we pray to you uh, constantly, day and night, in short expressions from our heart, both short and long, Lord. May we not despise short prayers or long prayers. Either way, Lord, may we dialogue with you continually as Nehemiah did. We pray all these things, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.